Oh my goodness. There we go. I think we got it. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Beyond the Steps. I'm Bree Zabrowski. I'm missing my other half, Melissa McDaniel. She is judging today, um, but we have a fantastic topic for you. We are talking today about what tools can we provide our young dancers to help them transition from studio life to a professional career. Such an important topic as we say goodbye to our graduating seniors. Um, and I'm chatting with our dear friend, Emily Bufford. So excited. Um, we're just going to give everybody a minute here to join on and then we're going to get started so I'm missing my uh, other half, Melissa. so pop your questions in the the comment box and it, we want to hear from you this is an open dialogue so please 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 contribute share let people know that we're having this conversation and to join in um, we're live on zoom and here on facebook at apollo performance so please please share and we're going to get started in just a minute All right, I think we got it. So you guys, if you're just joining, I'm Bree with Apollo. Happy Friday. It's April 16th. Thank you to everyone joining us on Facebook. I see you all joining in um, and here on Zoom. I am Bree. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Apollo Performance, where I'm flying solo today. As I just said, I'm missing Melissa McDaniel. She is judging today. Um, so Melissa, hello. If you're watching, we miss you. Uh, she will be back with me next week. Uh, we talk all the time about how important it is to include other tools and resources into our dance training from strength and conditioning to nutrition and mental health um, and layering these things on top of, of dance technique creates a happy, healthy, whole dancer from head to toe, inside out, how important that is. Um, before we introduce our guest panelists, I'm gonna give you guys a few reminders um, throughout the episode, you're going to see me looking around. I'm monitoring the chat here and talking to our friends on Zoom, um, engaging. We want to hear, hear your questions. This is an open dialogue. We're chatting today about what tools we can provide young dancers as they transition to help them transition from studio life to a professional career. So, you know, we want to hear your thoughts, your experiences. Maybe you have some things that you've tried with your dancers. If you're an educator that has helped them and been effective or a program you run at your studio. We want to hear all about it because this is to help us all um, evolve and, and grow and get better. We're on this journey together. So again, we want to hear from you. Pop those questions and comments in the chat boxes here on Zoom or on Facebook, and we will get those answered and, and chat about those with Emily um, throughout the episode. So I'm going to introduce my friend, Emily Bufford, we love her to death. She is the ultimate educator. She, I mean, when you talk about somebody who is kind and compassionate and knowledgeable and amazing, this woman encompasses all of that. Um, she's on faculty at Broadway Dance, Dance Center and Steps on Broadway in New York. Um, from the examiner.com straight from them, Emily Bufford continues to impact the New York dance scene that could not be more true. She's the producer of Young Choreographers Festival, um, which presents the future of dance, and she's a sought after educator around the US and abroad, and you can find her at emilybufford.com, and we will put that in the chat as well. Emily, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Oh, I love it. I love when I get to see your face. Um, so you've accomplished so many things in your career. You're absolutely brilliant in, in not only your choreography and your movement and the talent and the energy that you exude, but also the way that you really resonate with your students. You, you just are such a caring um, just compassionate, amazing human being. And you just know the right things to say and do. And the way that you guide da your dance students into tomorrow is, is just amazing. I mean, I, I really haven't seen anybody truly accomplish it the way that you do and the way that you stay connected to them. So, um, you know, you founded Young Choreographers Festival, which is an annual event that promotes the work of the next generation of talented choreographers. Can you tell us a little bit about YCF and how it's kind of become this launching pad for the next generation of artists? 
Absolutely. So Young Choreographers Festival, YCF for short, is where we have for the last on hiatus for this past year and this one because of pandemic, but for the last 10 years have presented 18 to 25 year old young choreographers. Um, and we mentor them and we showcase them to the best of our ability and we help them get their legs. We really do our best to make sure that they have the education and the information to then go out and be successful to the best of their ability. And our mission statement is, you know, education, presentation, cultivation. And it's so important for us that we are not just putting somebody's work on stage and then throwing them out into the dance community and saying, here, we gave you stage time, but to really make sure that they have the education and the information to back that up so that they can go and be contributing members of the community and thrive. You know, it's our goal really to take a young choreographer and say, we see your talent and we see your effort and we're going to now take those things and we're gonna give you what you need. We're gonna give you those tools and help you be successful. So what inspired you to do that? Did you feel like there was a gap that that was something that was missing? Why did you do that? I myself was a young choreographer when I founded YCF, which is in hindsight, such a crazy thing to think back yeah. that people allowed a 20 year old to do this, but I was a young choreographer and one of my dear mentors allowed me to accompany him to a selection panel for another very well-respected festival. And my observation as I watched what was going on was that if you did not have professional materials, i.e., you know, yeah. a press kit at the time, now most things are done digitally, but if you did not have a press kit to submit with professional photos and materials showing that your work had already been presented somewhere and so that the people on the panel could see what your work looked like as a fully produced package, um, not that your work didn't get looked at, but it didn't get looked at in the same light, so to speak. And I very quickly recognized that I fell into the bracket of artists who did not have those materials and that I, as a young artist, my work was gonna be looked at, but not seen necessarily as of value in the way that a more established festival would see it. And so in that moment, I was like brainstorm and I had this idea and I thought, we're gonna, we're gonna change this. And so YCF came for, to fruition from that. And because at the time I was working as an intern at the now unfortunately defunct dance.com. Yeah. Um, every time I tell this story, I have to give a big shout out to Joe Cody who heard me out as my boss. I was like, I have this idea and I want to you know, put the show on. And he heard me out and he said, well, where do you want to do it? Or what are we doing? And I said, well, I already booked a space and June 6th that symphony space. And he was like, wait, what? You did what? You, and I was like, no, I wrote a check. I wrote them a deposit. We have the space. <laughs> and, happening. You know, from there, he opened up his Rolodex and some of my now dearest mentors, but also board members came from that, that opportunity that they allowed me. Yeah, I, I love it. I love that you just took took the reins and kind of created um, something that was so necessary because you really, as a young dancer, you only know what you know. I mean, that's the whole theme of the dance community. Like you do what you were taught, you know as much as you know and as much as you were taught. And then there's this whole other world out there of, of experience that you have to get exposed to. And one of the most important things is mentorship and that all so many of the conversations I have on Insta Live and that we have here on Beyond the Steps are so uh, it's so important to have that mentorship in your life um, that guidance as you make that transition from studio to professional and that is why we're here today and there's nobody better to speak on that than you so thank you again for being here um, so I want to start let's get into it I want to start by talking about the challenges specific challenges that young dancers face as they transition from studio training to professional career because they're they are very specific um, it, the, the challenges change as you get deeper into the industry, right? But name some of the most common things you see and hear when you talk to dancers that are just starting out or maybe contemplating making that move. One of the biggest ones is actually to that topic of mentorship is that a lot of young dancers as they're transitioning from studio to either to New York or LA or to college is that lack of relationship that they don't have it yet with somebody in their new space, you know, you have your mentors back home. I have mine from when I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, 
but then you jump into a new environment and you have the relationship you've had from home. And oftentimes those teachers have worked in those places and they can offer their insights in that, in that element, but they don't necessarily have somebody in that new place to guide them from there to kind of pick up the reins and go, oh yeah, like this is, you know, the transition you're going to need help with. And so I think that is a big one. And I know oftentimes it gets queued up as networking, but it's not networking, it's relationship building. And having a mentor is a relationship. And so I would offer a young dancer moving or graduating and going on to pursue is find someone. And mentorship is two ways also. So never be to the young artist, never be pushy into a relationship. But if you see somebody that inspires you and motivates you and you feel um, connected to them, they might take you in under their wing naturally. It might be the natural progression of the relationship or it might be something, not everybody is as, dare I use the word empathetic or their EQ picks up on that hope as quickly. And so if you have that desire to be mentored by somebody, I think it's okay to express it. I think you're great. And I would, you know, yeah. wonder if you'd be willing to mentor me. Yeah. And, and it's so, it, I found, especially over the last year, I mean, I think it's always been the case in the dance world, but people are so in the dance industry are so generous and giving of their themselves and their time. Um, I, I think sometimes people, people would think the opposite, but it's not the case. They're so generous and so giving of themselves and their time. They, most people really do want to help if they can and share their experiences. And so a lot, oftentimes just reaching out and going, Hey, you know, I saw you here or, you know, you impacted me in this way that that's enough to really get some, some feedback and, and, and start that relationship don't you think I do I think wholeheartedly that people in dance more often than not are some of the most generous people you will ever find they're busy they're working but they will I always say you don't necessarily have time but you'll make time um they'll make time they'll find it they will go digging in their scheduling they'll I might not be able to meet with you until like Friday night at 11 30 well, and because and let's be honest night. these are yeah these are people that are not doing something for the money they're not motivated by financial okay, they're doing something most of us are doing it because we have this passion that won't quit for this this amazing art and sport that we all love and do right Absolutely. so and you want I think most and I say mostly because there's always an outlier or something, but the common thread is that people in the arts want young people in the arts to thrive. Yes. I don't they want the industry to succeed. And it only yeah. succeeds if if young people keep it going, right? They have to. There has to be progression of, you know, young artists, middle. I know sometimes people get all in the head about like the age thing, but like young artists, not quite as young artists, middle age artists. Yeah a little past middle age artists, older artists, there has to be that progression and that trajectory. And it takes somebody more established saying to a younger artist, like, yes, I'm absolutely here to support you. Reach out to me. Here's my number. Send me a text or here's my email. Send me an email. What can I do to serve you in some element of how do I help you, you know, grow? So why all of that then, right? Like we know uh, people are generous and they're, they're, everybody's really motivated to continue to have the dance industry grow and evolve and, and thrive. Why then do you think there's such a lack of preparation or is there, there uh, maybe there's not, I, I think there is, there's an overall lack of preparation when you send these kids out into the world. Um, and even like college, like we're going to talk about the different paths that you can take, but college is very, very different path in terms of the program you're getting, the training you're getting, than what, what you need to be prepared to go work commercially, right? So yeah. there's this like, just this disconnect, I think of like, you know, what to expect. And I think sometimes we lose some time there. There are young dancers lose some time in, in stumbling and, and figuring those things out on their own. What can we do to make that process smoother for them? I think, and why is there, why is there such a lack of preparation? Let's start there. I think the lack of preparation is cause and effect. The cause of it in many elements is that, and I grew up at a studio competing as well, 
is that you go you grow up perhaps at a school that competes and the focus is we go to competition and so you're rehearsing and then you're going to compete and you graduate and all of a sudden the focus has gone from we're having rehearsal and you're going to compete to you have to be self-motivated to go to class because you're not guaranteed stage time because you yeah. haven't you know earned your legs yet or your training was great where you grew up but there are things that you now need that you need to kind of relearn or learn in a different way i'll never forget actually one of the best things but also one of the scariest things one of my mentors ever did for me was when uh, my dear mentor ginger helped me redo my resume yeah. when i moved to new york and she i mean literally ripped off any competition related accolade that had been on there from ever and i was like because it feels it feels so those things feel so important when you're 17 year old you you know yeah. all the work you're like look at what i've done but really out there that doesn't that means i don't want to say it means nothing but it, it doesn't um, hold the weight respectfully to it because I grew up in it and I'm so I'm grateful for those experiences and I think it taught me a lot of wonderful skills and I am an advocate of it yes um I think competition teaches you so many wonderful things team player responsibility etc cetera, etc cetera. like the list I management on. discipline we could go on and on right on and on um but it also doesn't necessarily set you up to look at the training as the most valuable part of what you do or the process to be the most valuable part of what you do because when you move to new york or la a lot of times you're going to be in process with somebody long before you get to be put on stage whereas when you're preparing for competition you're rehearsing a number it gets set it gets yeah. cleaned it gets put on stage and so the process is different not less than, but very different in that element. And I do, I remember her taking all of those things off my resume and I looked at it and I went, all that's left is my training. Yes. And she was like, and right now that's that's all that matters. Yeah. Until you get a job and you can add that to your resume and then, you know, and then your resume will build. So right. it's kind of a jarring moment as an 18 year old to go, oh, wow, I thought I had these things on my resume. And now in hindsight or moving forward from it, all I have is my training. Yeah. And yeah. I think if we would mentally prepare young dancers for that moment of what's going to matter the most is the work. Not um, not your high platinum, not your like third place overall at whatever competition it was. Those things will matter to you in that moment. And they might help you after you graduate with, you know, again, that idea of relationship building. You might have a mentor from those times or right. my studio, we didn't really go to convention all that much as I was growing up, but I see now, you know, the kids have relationships with the teachers from convention and do foster those relationships because those teachers can be a mentor for you once you graduate, many of them, and I'm sure they're willing to do so. Um, but the disparity of where the focus lies, I think is a hindrance to a lot of young dancers who are graduating and stepping into the world and then, you know, going into college again, I did not go to college for dance. I think you have to find the path that fits for you. Um, I share this story openly. My dream school was SUNY Purchase and I did not get in because of my build. And quite candidly, it's probably one of the best things that ever happened. I think, you know, you end up where you're supposed to end up, Absolutely. but you have to be equipped for stepping into that moment. And so that that time lag, if you will, of a dancer figuring out, like, what am I doing now that I'm not in my studio environment? I think the thing that's the most important of it is the self-motivation element of you've graduated from a space where you knew that you had to show up, let's say four nights a week plus rehearsals on Sundays. And all of a sudden, if you go to a college dance program, there's still going to be that expectation, but the expectation shifts a little bit because you have to be self-reliant on, yes, I'm going to wake up and go to my 8 a.m. ballet class. Like it's for a grade, but I, you know, if I don't go, I don't go. There's not going to be somebody calling you and saying, hey, you didn't show up to your ballet class today. Or this is one I hear a lot from my students that went on to a college program 
there who are used to you know the highly competitive environment the tricks the choreography that you know that's the focus on the technique and they go to these college programs and they're like this is just not what i this is not what i was used to. i'm used to i don't like this like I, I want you know all my training that i've been doing and all the styles and then it's it's very different in that that program and it's very contemporary or modern based and you know the 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 flash isn't there so much and they miss that you know and so that's a big shake up from from my experience as well when, when i talk to kids it's a huge shakeup. I definitely think there are some programs now that didn't exist yeah. perhaps when I was looking at schools or even until a few years ago, quite candidly, where there's more flash in some of the programs now than there had been. Yeah, there's definitely, they're, they're, they're evolving a little bit, I think. They're evolving. They're doing more work for camera. They're teaching the kids how to do you know, promotional material, the programs have definitely evolved a ton from where they had been. But yeah, absolutely. All of a sudden, you've been doing jazz and contemporary and lyrical and training to for competition and pulling your leg up your back for the last eight years. And now you're taking a gram class every day or yeah. a home class. And you might have some foundational element. I feel I'm really grateful. Actually, my teachers growing up, we had modern every week. Yeah. God bless Jody Meacham. Shout out to Joanne Meacham. Um, we had a modern class every week and the kids at the studio I grew up at still have a modern class every week. And I think while you're doing it as an early teenager, you might not appreciate it. Like I did not appreciate my modern class nearly enough as I was doing it, as I was a 14, 15, 16. By the time I was 17, 18, I had been coming to New York and I saw that it was a necessity. And I'm grateful for those classes, even on the days where it didn't feel as good in my body as some of the other things, because it set me up for a better understanding of what was going to be expected of me when I stepped out into the real or not the real world, but the professional realm right. of like trying to um, work. And I do think it can be culture shock to a young dancer. And I think if we can, even if you're not necessarily offering modern at your studio, if we can sit down with them and have that conversation of, you know, you haven't done this yet, but you're going to be doing it depending on the program. Or even if you're not in a college program, like let's hypothetically say dancer moves to New York this is kind of more along the lines of what I did. And I built my own program. I wasn't in a dance program. I took my classes at the studios and I, I now teach at, and I used to go downtown to it's what's given me now, but it was dance New Amsterdam at the time. And I would take modern class because I knew that if I wanted to work to be viable, you have to have that understanding. And I think sitting down with a young dancer and having that dialogue with them and being candid about we've been doing this, but you're also going to need to do this Absolutely. or you take one ballet class a week now, but really you're going to need to bump that up to like three ballet yeah. classes per week. Um, depending upon the genre you want to work in, of course, if somebody is moving to LA to be a street styles dancer, I respect that. In that case, go to the classes that are appropriate to that genre to work in that field. Know where you're, in other words, know where you're going and be yeah. prepared for that, right? Because it, because what you've been doing to this point is wonderful. It's laid your foundation. It's been great, but it is not where you're going. You need to you need to then equip yourself for that path, right? Yeah, because I, I just had this conversation on Wednesday with I talked to Carlos Garland and Marissa Dolan of Dance Look, yeah. and they have this wonderful apprentice program, which I'll share a little bit more about later. Um, and that was one of the things that came up was the the lack of preparedness in modern because it is such it is a focus in college programs it's a focus when you go to New York um, but then there's this also there's this parallel of like when are kids really ready to learn modern because you really almost have to have a solid foundation laid before your body can even take it on yeah take it on and understand that right so like there's this like window of time that we have as dancers in, in the studio level to really train and understand that because you really have to get the foundation first. And so it's just like, when and what, how do we introduce that? And then on top of that, we'll talk about this in a minute, but mental skills and strength training and all the things that we have to layer, layer in as well to be healthy and, and take care of ourselves. So um, 
what you know we're gonna we're gonna dive into this more in the second segment but just talk about a little bit about the importance of the role of family friends and you know educators in in this transition process too because it, you know it, it it's you think it's just you that's impacted by this but it's not it, it's it's everybody in your life it's everybody and i think and i mentioned this in another dialogue I had with somebody a couple of weeks ago, but it's that if you either, you either support the dancer who wants to pursue dance or please just get out of their way. Right. <laughs> and that sounds harsh, but if somebody has decided that this is the path they want to take, they're not going to law school, they're not going to medical school. Like that's not something that interests them because I think at this point, um, young dancers are, equipped enough and aware enough and I do think we have to give them due credit where it is due to them they know that pursuing dance is hard yeah so you're not convincing them to do something else because dance is hard because they're already aware of that and, and so they've made the choice anyway they yeah made and they're actively making the choice to pursue it anyway and I would say do so either support them or just kindly say you know I I can't support you in this but with love, like, and then step out of the way, but don't try to discourage it. It will not work. And I say that from experience in seeing some of my kids whose parents have been more supportive versus parents who are not as supportive. When I see kids at studios and somebody will say, oh, their parents just don't really support them. And I'm like, they're going to do it anyway. Like yeah. the kid is going to, you know, and if it's a financial well, and thing, yeah. And what I want to say too, is if you are going to support them and you're making the conscious choice to do that, to go a step further and learn what it is that they're doing. Learn, you know, my parents were extremely supportive when I moved out to LA. I mean, I could not have asked for more. I mean, I, I was like, I graduated college. And I'm like, I'm going to quit my job with benefits and a salary and I'm going to move to LA now. And they're like, okay, like, let's do this, you know? And, but God bless them. Like, I didn't know what what that meant. They didn't know what that meant. And they were going to do everything they could, can to help me get there, but they didn't know. They just, they just didn't know. They, they, it wasn't a thing. I was like the, the only person ever in my family to just, to do anything like that. So um, it, it, there's just this lack of understanding, not because you don't want to understand, just this, it's so outside of the way that you grew up that you might want to support somebody, but, you know, saying I support you and actually learning what it takes and how you can support them is a very different thing. It is. And actually similar experience, obviously not with having a full-time job with benefits before I moved to New York, as I moved here when I was 18, but my parents are the best. They're the most supportive. Sometimes yeah. I joke that actually my mom is watching, but that people actually appreciate her being present at events more than they appreciate my being present at events because she is the champion yeah. of the dance moms in, yeah. the, in the best sense of it, not in the yeah. sense of it. But they learn as they go a lot of the times, you know, it is so different than having a nine to five job or pursuing a career like that. And I think in some ways, like the way up the ladder, I think is similar. And I use this as the analogy of like, young dancers moving to New York, you start out kind of as the intern, like metaphorically, if you were to get a job at a law firm, like, and how a parent can kind of yeah. see it more cut and dry, treat your kid as if they just got a job as an intern, then hopefully they get promoted. That is to like great advice. Senior associate, and then hopefully they become an associate, and then they become a junior manager, and then they are a manager, God willing, and then eventually, you know, once they've progressed, and they've done that work, and they've worked their way up the ladder, they've become either like, you know, a senior manager or a partner would be the equivalent of the, at the firm. And I think that sometimes is an easier way for a, a non parent to understand the trajectory of what their child's career path will look like, because you do, you start at yeah. the bottom, even at a place like a law firm, you're going to be an unpaid intern before you're a regular intern. I, I love it so much. And I wish I would have had it. I wish I would have known, heard that when I started, because it would have helped so many people in my life who, who did go, I mean, did not go anywhere in that direction, understand better, you know, what, what it was that we were trying to accomplish, what I was trying to accomplish. I think that's brilliant. And in also to give to the young dancers of that idea, because I think sometimes you get young dancers who don't, not that they don't understand why they haven't been hired for something. You have to get your feet wet. You have to be seasoned. You have to have work experience to get more work. Like 
there's always this finite trajectory of like, most people follow this kind of pathway of this is how you build your career as a dancer or as somebody working in the arts. Um, but having somebody, you know, sit down and explain to you that, like, think of your first several gigs as your unpaid internship. Yeah. Because if you were working in any other field, you would have that for the most part, you know, always, there's yeah. always going to be an outlier, but you would be an unpaid intern somewhere. And if you're an unpaid intern as somebody's assistant or you're an unpaid intern as somebody's apprentice or insert dance job of choosing, um, I know sometimes you get where people are like, well, I'm only going to take the gig if I'm paid. And I respect that I do. And I think jobs should be paid. I pay my dancers for their time at this point now that I'm able to. But I also think when you're young in the arts or anywhere, that experience sometimes trumps a, the paycheck of it because the experience like you, that it. you get the paycheck someday and it's going to teach you skill sets that will help you be a really valuable member of somebody's company or a really valuable member of somebody's team um and i do think it's important to take that away from both young dancer young artist side but also parent side of the equation of if your kid was working in any other field it would be basically the same. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up because that, that is another thing. And I think, I think kids can very easily misinterpret, you know, you know there's a lot of really great conversations on social media and um, in, in very uh, well-known organizations about dancers should be compensated, dancers should get paid, and they absolutely should. There is no doubt about it. However, there is this little gray area when you're just starting out and we talk about building this resume and all the things that you think go on your resume as a young dancer and come off the resume they don't mean anything and you really have to fill that with something else you have to build that experience you have to build that resume the way it the way that it will resonate where you're going right so um so doing those jobs and taking those opportunities to make connections and and get the experience of a job and be on set or what have you it is so valuable um to getting where you want to go even though it doesn't necessarily come with a paycheck and not to be confused with being disrespectful if there is a budget and there, there is a project that has a budget, you absolutely should get paid if you're part of that project. But if nobody's making any money and this is just, um, you know, a piece of work that's going out in the world that you can put on that resume, I mean, don't you think that's so valuable? It, I think it's invaluable. Quite candidly, I think opportunities like that are priceless. I personally did them for many years. I still yes. do things for free often. I have no qualms about it. I'm in a place where if the project strikes me and it lights me up, then I yeah. want to do it. And again, it's about that relationship and about learning a new skill. Um, but I spent many, many, many years as an assistant to some very well-renowned teachers and choreographers and payment comes in many forms, you know, and as a young artist, you also have to look at the relationship dynamic of it. You might not be being paid in a dollar amount, but you're being paid in knowledge, you're being paid in experience, you're being paid in other relationships that you're able to build from that relationship when they take you and introduce you to these new people that you're getting to meet that you would never have had the opportunity to be in a room with if it were not for that relationship dynamic. And I also think, you know, payment does come in many forms in the sense of, and I'll use just my assistant as my example is that she's working but in exchange for her working my class is free to her to both of them to both of my assistants right now and that is payment yeah training is payment getting mm -hmm. class is payment and i think we've lost that idea for a little bit of young dancers thinking well this is actually a form of payment i'm very fortunate i work with kind humble humans all yeah. the time yeah. um and i hope that my mentors would feel that i was the same in that regard to them as well but payment does it comes in so many other ways than just here's a check and as a young dancer or as a young dancer's parent please understand that sometimes the relationship value is actually more than the dollar value yeah absolutely and and that and again that's really important i think as educators we need to really be aware 
of what we're, you know, when we are saying dancer, you know, dancers should be compensated, dancers, you know, should be paid, yes, but also remember the ears that are hearing you, how they may interpret that and make sure you're very, very clear as they enter the dance community, you know, that that may not be as black and white as it sounds to them. And also that that families and friends and support systems, if you're hearing that they're doing a job and not getting paid, you know, don't discourage that just because that doesn't ring true with the value system that you have, because it is a different, you may not understand the path that they're on fully in the industry that they're in. Absolutely. And I would encourage parents then ask questions, ask your, ask your dancing child questions about the job that they're telling you they're not getting paid for, because they might say to you, well, I'm not getting paid, but I'm assistant on somebody's working on a TV show and I'm getting to be on set and I'm getting to learn Mm -hmm. all of these skills that quite candidly, and this is kind of, I know, jumping to what you had mentioned about college programs. teaching or not teaching or now recently adding to curriculums, but there is no experience like real life experience. And so you can sit in a classroom and have somebody tell you this is what happens over and over and over again. But until you find yourself in the actual circumstance, it doesn't necessarily resonate as fully. And so I would, I would encourage a parent what is that what is that job you're working on what is it entailing what is your responsibility what are you learning yeah i love that because when they can verbalize the skill set that they've learned that there was literally no other place they would have come to understand the requirements for it that the value there as an assistant if you get paid when you get paid it's not a ton of dollar amount it's just not it's the nature of what it is Again, you're the intern at that point when you're an assistant, basically you're the junior associate on that chain. The pay scale is not going to be that high, but the experience scale, the skill set, the skill set, excuse me, learning scale, it could be priceless. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. Um, If you guys are just joining, I'm Brie with Apollo Performance. We're chatting with Emily Buffer today. Uh, This is Beyond the Steps. We are talking about what tools we can share with our student dancers as they prepare to transition successfully from studio life to a professional career. Um, Very, very different things. And uh, there's a lot to consider here. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the paths you can take and, and I, we could sit here and talk forever. I know, but quickly let's talk about the different paths that are available for dancers. You know, you've got college, right? You've got a commercial career, which, you know, could be at this point, uh, LA, Vegas, Vegas New, York, New York, Atlanta. Well, Atlanta, it could be cruise ships, it could be, and you know, we're talking in general, obviously things have have changed a little bit due to the pandemic and we we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. We hope these things and we see these things start opening back up safely and slowly um, and we're optimistic, right? But in general, those are the things. And then, you know, so so there's these different paths. There's commercial, there's college, um, you know, like I said, cruise ships. Um, What are the things that young dancers and their families, if the families are involved, should be considering as they make that decision? Because it is deeply personal. It is very very different. You know, you can't tell every student to follow the same path because every student is uniquely different. Every student. I mean, you have to always have a, a genuine sit down with the specific dancer and say, you know, what do you feel in your gut and what do you feel in your spirit and what do you truly want to pursue? Because if a dancer says, I want to move to New York and pursue musical theater, great. There are a lot of pathways that lead to that place. There are college programs where the BFA is in musical theater and you come out of a program fully equipped. There are dancers who move to New York at 18 and do their training here and get a vocal coach and they start auditioning and they start working perhaps a little bit sooner, or they start auditioning a little bit sooner, or there are dancers who want to do a two-year program. And I taught for the Joffrey School for the training program for many years. And that program is as many, I believe, as three years, but you could go for two years. You could go for one year. You could use it as a gap year. There are many programs that exist like that. And I really think it is important to sit down and have a great understanding from the dancer who is sitting in front of you telling you this is what I hope to do. And then 
look at how many paths there are to do that specific thing because the dance world is so big and filled with opportunity i know it oftentimes feels small and a lot of times it it is small because a lot of the same people are working in many of those varying opportunities but there are so many places and directions that you can go that i would i would truly say it's a sit down conversation and it's a listening conversation yeah. and yeah. then if you as the parent or the teacher who who is having this conversation doesn't feel equipped to give them i don't want to say correct information but broad enough information yeah that's when i have a very love hate relationship with social media but that's where i love social media because at that point i then if i was the parent or if i was the teacher i would go on my social media and i would I post stuff on there all the time, sometimes asking questions, sometimes not, but I would say my kid wants to do this, or I have a student who wants to do this and I could use some guidance. There's so many great things there. on social media. There's fantastic groups and support and, um, for sure, for sure. And, but what do you, okay. So what do you do though? Because I've had this happen. What do you do when a, a kid says, I want to do this? And you know <laughs> that 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 kid is not fully thinking through, like th if that's not the right path for them, right? Like they, 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 that's not what they're suited for. You know this in your heart of hearts, that your experience, you know this. What do you say to that kid? Um, it's funny, this is coming up. I'm having a deja vu from a conversation I actually had very recently. You guide them kindly and you're truthful with them. Yeah. This is not a path that, let's use being a rock cut, for example, just because it's a very finite cut and dry. Yeah, yeah. And I personally am too short to be a rock cut. So <laughs> I would hope, and I think they would have, but if I had a dancer who's my height come to me and say, my dream is to be a rock cut, what can I do to become a rock cut? I probably would try to crack a joke because I think keeping it light, probably a bad, like very dad-esque joke, try to keep it light, but be candid with them and say, I, I don't want to crush your dream. And I think we can find something that will be suited to you, but you're not five foot six. And because you're not five foot six, being a Rockette is not unfortunately going to be a reality for you because that's one of the requirements of being a Rockette. Right. And I know, and I hear it and I'm like, oh, it stinks to have that dialogue. It really does. It's a fine line. You don't want to, you know, trample their dream, but it's also, you don't want them to lose time figuring that out on their own. So you want to give them the information to help them avoid those pitfalls, right? I think also not even to help them, well, to always to help somebody avoid a pitfall as best as you possibly can, but mm -hmm. also to support them in a realistic manner. Yeah instead of going, yeah, totally, I support you, go try to be a Rockette, knowing in your That's heart of hearts right. that there's there's no chance of that happening because you do, you have to be five, six and you're only five, five and a half. Right. Um, on my tallest day, I am yeah. five, five and three quarters. Yeah. That is still just a quarter of an inch shy. Of and it matters. That and matters. it does matter. And I think actually, just to add to this, it's important to be honest with dancers in any realm. And so if you know that something is not going to be for them, I think you have to have the guts as the teacher or as their parent, or not so much as the parent, because oftentimes the parent doesn't necessarily know that, but it's the teacher to like really have the gumption to sit down and have that heart to heart with that dancer and go, there are so many you know, performances that are similar in feel to the Rockettes that are not the Rockettes, but we can still set you up for success in a direction that gets you towards your dream. Yeah. And also going one step further than that, saying to them, okay, you know, maybe it's not the Rockettes, but maybe it's, I want to go to New York or I want to go to LA, but maybe they, they have a better look and they would do well in New York before they go to LA or something like that. But have you, you know, do you have vocal training? Like, is that something you need to consider? And asking them questions that maybe they haven't thought of because it is, uh, you know, it, that may have a play once they start hearing all these things that it's going to require for them to succeed there. 
you know, they'll look into it on their own and they'll go, okay, well, am I willing to do this or am I not? And then also understanding that it's probably more than one conversation. It's probably, I remember um, one year in particular, I had two seniors and it was very, one had no idea what, where she wanted to go. I mean, was it was it was the, the topic all year long. I would have weekly meetings in my office about, okay, what are you two doing to get to get yourself where you want to be, you know, what, what are we doing? How are we going to make these decisions? And it, it became so personal for me because I'm so invested in these two people and, you know, one wanted to go to LA and he needed to be in New York and he's there now and he's so happy and doing great. But the other one had no clue. And it was a series of, it was every week all year long from August until June when they graduated of like, how are we like, what are we going to do here? And we worked on it together and they had goals every week. And so understanding as an educator, like that's what they need from you um, is, is so important because you, you're you going to be able to provide them something that everyone else in their life can't. And it is, it's so important. And I think just to piggyback off, you're saying that some, some kids are going to come to you and they're going to say, I know what I wanted. I mean, I remember even just myself, I remember telling my college counselor who Lord lover was like, what about McGill in Canada? And I was like, I want to move to New York. Oh, that's all I want to do. I want to go and I want to work and be part of the dance community in, in New York because I had spent a summer here. The vibe, I just, it lit me up inside. I knew that New York was where I belonged. When you have a kid who's that, like this, is, I know in my gut, this is where I should be going. Even if I have an inkling of hesitation, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of go with your gut for myself, but also for my students. And I would rather support them in that gut feeling they have than dissuade them and then, then have them be like, oh, I really wish I had gone here. Yeah. And not that you kind of have to fail upward, yeah. but if they go where their spirit felt inclined to go and then they don't thrive there. The beauty right. of dance, which also the downfall of dance, but the beauty of dance is that even if you're in a college program and you end up somewhere and you're just like, oh, wow, after a semester or a year or even two years and you're like, I thought this was for me, but this is not for me. And I, I have okay. things all the time that, you know, they transfer or they go and then I don't like the word dropout. They leave to pursue something different on their dance path or their, on their dance journey that feels more of a correct fit. You can change course. Dancers yeah. are sailboats. They are not like a liner. Actually, they're not that boat going through the Suez Canal where it like got stuck and it just was stuck in that yeah. little grid. You know, dancer can put their sail up and go, this course was not for me. I'm just going to like. Yeah, the pivot. I, I call it the pivot. The pivot is is powerful. It is a big, it's, it's so important. The pivot is so important and being able to do that and, and change course is, is really important and in life period. I think as a teacher, it's important if you have a kid, even if they've graduated, like, and they're in school and then they reach out and they say, yeah. you know what, I thought this was right, but it wasn't. Or if you had told them, I don't think it's right for you, but I want you to go with your gut and they do. And then they discover it wasn't the right fit you can always change course. I like that. The yeah. pivot is powerful and you can, and there's no harm or shame in doing it. And I think actually a lot of times parents who are not necessarily dancers or artists themselves will see that like, oh, why are you feeling like you're in the wrong program? Or why, you know, why are you feeling the need to change course? But dance, dancers are very, I, Dancers are emotional is the truth of the matter. And so if you're somewhere in a program that doesn't sit well with you or feel like it's the right fit, it's gonna be hard for that dancer to continue and thrive in that program for whatever the reason is, if it's either the, you know, the course load or the faculty or the environment. I mean, some dancers thrive coming to New York City and some dancers move here and are like, whoo, city life is not for me. This is not what I signed up for. Like the realization that, you know, living in New York is hard or living in LA is hard. Maybe they would have been happier in a program. I'm just going to throw out OCU because it's a wonderful program, but like living in a place that's a calmer outside yeah. environment, your program is intense. And so you don't need the intensity of what your outside or your external environment is going to offer. And I do, I just think you know, that offering to the kid of, we're here to support you as teacher, also as parent. Um, we want you to do what feels right in your gut. 
we want to send you in a direction where we feel like you're going to thrive always. I really try to make sure that I don't throw my kids into circumstances where deep in my, because again, listening to your gut, like, yes, I want you to listen to your gut. But if my gut is like loudly screaming at me that you're going to, that program you're telling me is your dream program is going to be an awful experience for you. At that point, I will chime in. But I do, I think those candid conversations are so important with your students of like, I think this direction is great for you. Absolutely. I support you no matter what, like go live your best life in whatever program or whatever direction you think is going to serve you best, but know that it's okay if you change your mind. Yeah. And I think giving them that permission, as you say, to fail upward and fail or fail forward is so important because it's going to allow them to move confidently into whatever space that is that they're going and, and, and come from the most confident place, which is really 90% of, of succeeding in the industry is having that confidence to be able to, you know, uh, persevere in the face of rejection and continue forward no matter what. Um, so I, I think giving them that confidence right off the bat is, is crucial. Uh, thank you for breaking all of that down. I'm going to move into the, the last segment because that's why we're here today, right? We're talking about the, the tools and the resources we can give our students to successfully transition from studio life to a professional career, whatever that is, in whatever regard. And I'm chatting with our friend Emily Buffer today, founder of Young Choreographers Festival. I'm Brie with Apollo, and this is Beyond the Steps. Um, Let's talk about what needs to happen at the studio level in your mind to help them transition. What can we do in our programs right now? We've talked about having conversations and continued conversations with our, our graduating seniors. Maybe it's starting at the beginning of their senior year having those continued conversations where we're talking about, um, we're helping them come to the conclusion of what's next, right? We're, we're giving them the tools and the resources in the conversation. What else? Things that can happen. So at studio level, I really wholeheartedly believe that the conversation by the time the dancer is 17, eight, or even 15, 16, about a shift in focus that it's about the training. Stage time is wonderful. And when you're in a studio environment and you're getting it regularly because you're competing or you have community performances, I'm a big advocate of all of those things. Um, Setting them up for success in the outside of the studio realm of the work is always going to be the most important part of what you do and really learning to appreciate it for exactly what it is. You showed up for class, you did your work, you went home knowing and having that sense of accomplishment from doing whatever it is that you did in the studio that day and having that be enough to keep you motivated to come back and do it the next day or the next week. Because once you step out of that studio realm and you're no longer getting on a competition stage, let's say once or twice a month or going to a convention and being pulled up on stage or having community performances, the work is what will be your constant. You can always go to the studio and take class. I love that. Thank you. Um, And then what should dancers be doing and preparing for now if they're serious about pursuing a career in dance? So so the summer before their senior year, what is it that they need to be doing? You know, yes, shifting their mindset, focusing on training, having the conversations, researching, um, researching their options, researching college dance programs. And really, that should start probably a little bit sooner, but researching college dance programs, researching if you want to move to New York and L.A., what are or Atlanta or Las Vegas or wherever you want to do cruise ships? Where are those auditions happening? What you know, what else should they be doing at that point? They should be making themselves a checklist a goals list and also a checklist. Am I equipped? Am I actually equipped to make this move? Let's use New York, for example. I'm moving to New York in August and I'm gonna take musical theater class. Great, you're going to theater class. Do you have a black leotard? Do you have tights? Do you have theater? Do you have character heels? Do you have uh, 16 bars? Cause some classes you go to do both. Do you have, um, have you ever had a, had vocal training in your life? Like, have do you you... Ever take, yeah. Have you ever had to sing in front of anybody right. other than your family and friends singing happy birthday ever? Because that, <laughs> let me tell you, that is a scarring experience. The first time a dancer 
is asked to sing and they are unprepared for it. Right. It's an experience that I try to prevent anyone from having. So if that's what you're pursuing, if you're going for concert dance, have you been taking several ballet classes per week? And I know there's a big conversation about ballet being the foundation of work. The way I see it in this moment, the reality of most of the concert dance that is currently being choreographed, the reality of it is, is the aesthetic of it requires ballet for better or for worse. But are you taking three to five ballet classes a week? Are you wanting to dance for a company that does point work? If so, have your point shoes ready. Um, do you have appropriate audition attire? Do you have an outfit that you feel like you thrive in where it's appropriate to what it is you're going in for and you're gonna need several because if you're going for concert work, you're gonna wear something different than if you're going in for musical theater and you're gonna wear something different if you're going in for commercial. And are you equipped with all of those things before you ever get off you know, your plane or your train or your bus or out of your car. And I think, so a checklist of sorts, as far as like actual physical items, do I have all of these things? Am I, am I prepared for these moments? Do you have tenacity? And I know that's not a physical thing, but are you tenacious? And I use this word a ton when I'm talking about dance and dancers, because Dance is hard. And I know young dancers coming from the studio. It's the hardest ranked job in the world. Like it was the, the number, number one, one, number one hardest job in the world. Like that's, number that's a one. thing that just happened. So dancers, choreographers, we are, we are number one. We are the champion in, it's the hardest to thrive and succeed in this field. And I think being tenacious is a quality that is often very underrated. Because you can come from your studio, you might be the best one in your hometown. And I know people talk about this often. I was not growing up in South Florida. I was far from the best in my hometown. But being tenacious and having that drive, like that self-drivenness attitude of, I'm going to go take my classes and I'm going to back to that idea of like the work is the most important part. I'm going to do my work and I'm going to show up and I'm going to show up with a good attitude also. Are you ready to take class and perhaps not get noticed at all for a week or two weeks or three months, however long it takes in a room? For yeah. And don't, so don't you think the mental toughness, that's, that, that's something that they need to start preparing for and, and healthy mindset skills, because it, it's only going to get harder, right? After, after high school, it's already hard in high school. And we already think dancers need more healthy mindset skills to cope with all the anxiety and the stress that they're dealing with. But it, it doesn't get better as you go out into the world, it gets harder, right? It so having- harder. And I'm really glad, actually, thank you for bringing that up because I had it in the back of my headspace and I was on my tangent about tenacity and neglected <laughs> it. Um, you have to have mental toughness because the truth of it is, is you could move to New York or you could move to LA and you come from your studio environment where everybody knows you. Yeah. Your teachers know you, your friends know you, people who come in as guest artists, if they come in regularly, they know you. And you move to a place where perhaps a handful of people know you, but because you're gonna diversify your training, the ballet teacher that you start taking with might not know you. And the modern teacher that you're gonna start taking with because you now know that you need to take modern class for your training might not know you. And New York class and LA class, open classes, you know, you will find your family in them, but you might not find them at your first class or your second class, it might take some time to find that place where you fit and you feel comfortable. Um, and you're gonna spend some of those classes where the teacher has regulars, myself fortunately included in that at this point, where they have their frontline dancers and those are the dancers they know and are actively training. And then they have dancers who come every now and again, and then they have you, the new, the new girl or boy or they, and they might not say anything to you the first class at all. They might not say anything to you for the first several classes. They are also, you know, you have to remember human connection works in two directions. And so for a teacher to invest in you, you as a student in New York or in LA, and I think actually this is an important thing that I hope teachers around the country at studios could share with their young dancers who are graduating is that uh, it's a two-way street 
in relationship dynamic with teachers in open classes and the teacher will absolutely invest in you, but you as a student also need to invest in them because it's a shared responsibility. I will train you to the absolute best of my ability but if I only see you once every six months, I can't invest in you the same way I'm invested in my student that I see every week. Yeah. And that's not because I don't want you to thrive. It's simply because once every six months, I gave you a note six months ago that I'm only now seeing you now. Um, whereas I want you to thrive. And so it's, you know, the same way in your studio, it builds upon the corrections build. It's the same in open class. And so that investment into that relationship is a two-way street. Yeah. And for them to share with the students that the teacher wants to invest in you. So if you like their class or you feel like you're learning from their class, the person leading that room would love to see you back and would love to be able to make that investment. And also go to the class in multiple locations. Like they'll, you know, like in LA, I would go one class at, at, at um, the edge and then they would be teaching the combo maybe later that week at Millennium or Debbie Reynolds at, when it was Debbie Reynolds, but you know, and they would do that and you would go and all of a sudden they see you, they remember you, you've had time to get that in your body and make it feel good. And you have a totally different class experience that time. And it helps you get noticed and make that connection with the teacher as well. And, but I wanted, that is a really great segue into the next thing, because let's talk about financial preparedness. We, I know we have to get to the homework. We're like over and, and I don't care because I think this is all really important information, but um, financial financial preparedness. You know, we, I was talking to Marissa and Carlos from Dance Look Again, that, that working with kids when they're still in high school about managing their finances, saving money, understanding what things cost so that they don't go out to these places completely blind because yes, you have to take classes and make connections and do all the great things, but you also have to pay your bills. So how are you going to pay for all of this? Um, I want to share with complete candor as I jump into this topic is that my parents have always been very supportive. And so, yeah, like, thank you and praise and, you know, hands in the air for the dance parents who are supportive and are able to be financially supportive as well. I know that is not the case for everybody and I see it. And so my offering in regard to that, and also in candor, I was a work study I did work study at Broadway Dance Center two shifts a week, actually, because while I did have support from my parents and do have support from my parents, even still to this day, when and if needed, um, I didn't feel it was appropriate to just ask constantly for that assistance for Absolutely. the training that I was doing. And so I think depending upon where you're moving, of course, research what the cost of living is, New York. It's expensive. <laughs> no matter where you're going, it's expensive. New York is expensive is maybe a generous. New York is absurdly expensive. Although right now, post-pandemic, it's a little bit more reasonable. So if you have kids wanting to move to New York, they can find an apartment for less than it would have been a year and a half ago, which I think will be a blessing in disguise for many. Um, but the cost of living in New York City is expensive. And I think a dancer needs to emotionally prepare for that as well that they're going to be working really hard and most of their financial responsibility will be to rent if they're not in a place where their parents are helping them or if they're in a place where they've just recently graduated college and so that the dorm life situation is gone um i do really encourage regardless of financial circumstance work study Broadway Dance Center has it, Steps on Broadway has it, Perry Dance Capizio Center has it. And I think it's good for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. The first and foremost being, it teaches you to really appreciate those classes. When you have to Thank work you. for something, you appreciate it more. And so when you're sitting behind, I did front desk at BDC for years. Hi, welcome to Broadway Dance Center. Yeah, I mean, years of it. And I loved it because it did. It really made me appreciate the opportunity and I also got to, I mean, I'm a chatty Kathy and we all know this, but like the camaraderie of it, of the dancers coming to sign in and the camaraderie, you make friends that way. Some of my yeah. dear friends still to this day were work studies with me or managers at the desk at that point. Um, but it also, it affords you class. It made, I don't know quite candidly right now what the work study rate is for the class, but at the time when I was work studying, it was for every hour you worked, you got a... I believe it was a $5 class 
That's great. And that $5 went directly to the teacher. So BDC basically was, you know, paying the remainder yep. of the rate for in exchange for my working. And then what I was paying for class went right to the teacher. And I, I think it's so important that dancers feel that sense of I earned this. Yeah. When people are handed things too easily and dancer in general, you see it just regardless, you know, not that they don't appreciate them, but there's this sense of like, it's tangible. So every yeah. time I would go into class where it was a work city class, where I had to sit at that desk and earn the hour of it or work the hour of it to earn that moment. I walked into class with the sense of like, I'm here to do I'm going to make the most of this. Yeah. Like 100%. I'm going to do my absolute best, whatever my best is today. I would also encourage teachers um, circling back to what they should share with their young dancers who are perhaps moving on to New York or LA. Your best is going to be different every day and teachers are not going to be drilling things. So you're not going to work on all the sit turns with somebody in New York. The class is going to change every time you take it with the exception of perhaps their warm up. And so getting into that healthy headspace of my best is going to vary every day because I'm not working on the same thing every day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. That is a great point. Um, and, and and also, I know we're going to get to homework right now and, and resources, but um, get your resume together. We talked about that earlier in the episode. Um, and there, I want to give a shout out to some really great programs because I think it's important to mention that there's really amazing things happening at the studio level all around the country um, right now. And if you're a studio, I, I encourage you to think of the ways that you can also build, you know, build some of the resources we've talked about today into your program to help your students as they go out into the professional world. But obviously, Young Choreographers Festival is huge. Emily's going to tell us in a second where we can um, find information about that and how we can participate in that and encourage our students to do so. But uh, the Bridge uh, the bridge Program at Mather Dance Company, uh, they're doing really great things. They're working on you know slating and social media training with their dancers and marketing because you are your own brand as a dancer. Um, and, and also, one thing we didn't mention, but I think is important, social media, clean up your social media. It is used for auditions right now. Um, that's how people look you up. They look you up to see if you're a right fit. Uh, you know, sometimes you can even book jobs through there. If you have pictures that maybe you don't want seen, go clear them off now and understand that it is really a business card in a sense. So um, don't you think I'm like clean up the social a little bit? Yes. And I, I share this story with permission from the dancer who shall yeah. remain nameless, but I worked with a wonderful male dancer many, 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 many years ago, who posted something in their story that was, they were underage at the time and a choreographer they had been hired to work with saw the story. And I share this again with permission of it as a, you know, as a lesson yeah. to hear. Um, we know, let's be real. We know young dancers, young people in general are going to do things that they maybe shouldn't be doing or we don't necessarily see as appropriate. If you're doing it, number one, please be safe always. But it cost him that job. That choreographer saw that story. And that was a story that disappears. That just like disappears yeah. after 24 hours. And that was a story. And it was a story, but wow. the choreographer saw it. And, you know, very nice message was left that said, you know, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, but I saw your story and you are underage was the gist of this message. And I just... That's not a responsibility yeah. I can right. take on because you have to understand for young dancers that that's a liability to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And absolutely. so, yeah, clean up your social media. We know, and I, again, said with love, we know you're going to do the things you're going to do. We don't expect you to be perfect, pristine, angelic humans. Everybody does things that they, you know, maybe shouldn't right. or look back and think, oh, but don't post about it. I always would tell my Joffrey kids, don't post about it. Don't put it on your Instagram. Don't put it in your story. Don't post about it on Facebook. You think it's friends only. Somebody screenshotted it. Just don't. Yeah. Keep learn, learn how the resume, the resume is going to be different than what you learned. It's not a business resume. It looks very different. I wish I would have learned that sooner. Um, it, it, you know, talk, look up dance resume specifically, or talk to somebody that knows how to build one, um, because they're very different than anything that anybody in your life probably understands how to build. Um, and you know, all the things that we talked about today, I, there's just been so many great resources, but shout out to Mather Dance Company, the Bridge Dance Program, Dance Look, Carlos and Maria are doing great work in Orlando.
Orlando um, with the Apprentice Program, and anybody around the country can join and be part of this program. They're actually having auditions in June. Um, so, and, and Mentorly, you know, our friends at Mentorly, they have a great mentorship program through mentorly.co. Um, check that out. It's, it's for all people in the arts. There's so many different things that, that you can uh, garner from that. So I encourage you to just look outside of your box because there's there's great work being done everywhere. And by, by no means is this, you know, all that's happening. I'm just mentioning the ones that are coming to mind right now. There's so many. Um, so so find those things and, and start looking into them now if you're interested in joining the professional dance world in any capacity. Emily, I want you to tell us one more time how people can learn more about uh, YCF, how they can be part of it or be considered to be a young choreographer. Tell us all the things again right now. Absolutely. Young Choreographers Festival, YCF, we are not for profit. We present 18 to 25 year old young artists annually here in New York City at Symphony Space live and in person shows. Um, we offer mentoring sessions and educational programming. It's my favorite thing that I do. And if you are interested in it, you can find us online at www.youngchoreographersfestival.com or on Facebook, uh, Young Choreo Fest or Instagram at YCF Dance. And for this year, because of the pandemic, our actually our 2020 young choreographers have been the most gracious during oh, this craziness. I can't imagine. They, they they truly they get the biggest shout out of love from me. They have been so so gracious. I personally do not want to do a live stream show. What we do is best live and in person. And so our show for 2022, June 18th, Saturday, June 18th, 2022. Hey will be our 2020 Young Choreographers presented finally live and in person because we are so hopeful that the world will be back to a more normal place at that point. Um, if you are interested though, and you have a young dancer who is curious about choreography, please have them look us up. We offer stuff on our social media all the time. We share past presentations. Our alumni have gone on and done some really amazing things and we share that work all the time. Um, the application, for 20, this is wild, for 2023, <laughs> we'll go live um, one week following our 2022 That's show. Right. The application will be available. We hope we will see your young artists work. In the meantime, please keep encouraging them to choreograph. I always say in the studio, and just one last thing, please offer your dancers in studio an opportunity to improv. Let them feel what their creative voice actually is. Let them start to discover that and do it in all genres. I think sometimes we think improv is just a contemporary thing. Let them improv in their contemporary class. Let them yes. improv in their tap class. Let them improv in their street styles class. Um, and let them just get a feel for what their offering is. Because I think one of the most beautiful things we can do for young artists is letting them figure out who they are. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So you guys have lots of homework. I know we we kind of, we didn't give you just one homework assignment today. There's lots. Um, start having conversations with your dancers um, at the beginning of their senior year about what, where they want to go and what they want to do with this. If they're, if they're really, really serious about it, start having those conversations. Dancers, you're going to start doing the research on your own, building out your resume, um, cleaning up that social media. And parents, you're going to do that research too and learn how to to how you can support your dancer, listen to them um, and, and, and learn how you can support them in their journey. Um, I have added, I, I know we usually talk about the Steps 2020 initiative and our friends at YPAD. Um, I've put the links to those things in the chat, uh, both here on Zoom and on Facebook. So uh, you can take our Steps 2020 initiative course for free. It's gonna tackle uh, topics, uh, give you educational resources and information on racism, gender and equities, uh, sex abuse, and prevention, dance, medicine, and science, nutrition, integrative dance, all curated and donated by experts in each field. And you can take this completely free on our website. The link is in the chats here. Um, we encourage you to take it as a jumping off point to learn further and, and grow in your journey. Um, also, our friends at YPAD do great work. There's a 25% off code to to get YPAD certified again here in the chat. So take advantage of that. Emily, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your knowledge. I feel like we, we could have sat here and talked for probably five hours today. <laughs> Yeah. always we get in a room we get anywhere together and we're like blah 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 but thank you so much for all of the insight i hope it was valuable to all of you out there watching um 
The recording of this full episode will be available on Facebook at Apollo Performance. Um, and please share, you know, that's why we do this. We have so many people that watch after the fact. Thank you for sharing. Please continue to share. I think this is very timely, another timely conversation as we prepare to say goodbye to some graduating seniors and, and, and we're planning for the new season of graduating seniors and what the world is going to look like for them. Hopefully this gives you some insight and how we can help and better prepare them to transition to that professional career. Um, I'm so honored to do this work every Friday with my friend, Melissa McDaniel. She was not here today. We missed her, um, but you can find us here every Friday at 2 p.m. Join us next Friday, April 23rd. We're chatting with Carlos Caraballo about safe stretching practices for student athletes. This is another good one. Um, I think a lot of valuable information is going to be shared there too. Until then, we hope you continue your journey beyond the steps. Everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Emily, thank you so much. Thank you, Bree. We'll Thanks, see you everybody. Bye-bye.